So today I want to look at a piece of scripture that has kept me going through really difficult seasons of life. I want to share it with you because there's some in this room who are going through a difficult season of life or who have gone through a different difficult season of life. And I'm going to call those difficult seasons of life uh, storms today. I'm just going to kind of use that as kind of the storms of life because uh, when life kind of gets dark and you don't really know where the end is or the beginning is and it's just hard and it's loud, it kind of feels like a storm. Kind of, I think of myself as a ship out at sea with waves tossing me back and forth. And so if you aren't in a storm this morning, uh, you'll likely be going into a storm at some point. My uh, old pastor used to say there's three stages of life. You're coming out of a storm, you're heading into a storm, or you're in a storm of life. That, that just kind of just seems to be how it is. And we don't know how long each of those seasons is, but that's just kind of the reality of it. We all go through difficult seasons. We all go through difficult storms. And it doesn't matter how much we pray or love Jesus, we will find ourselves in difficult seasons of life on a regular basis. The truth is, I found myself in one the past several months. It wasn't accompanied by some great tragedy, but rather just a lot of feelings of doubt, a lot of feelings of anxiety, a lot of feelings of worthlessness and self-pity, and uh, desires to flee my current situation and depression so much more. And some of you are really surprised to hear that. It's like, wait, the pastor struggles with doubt and anxiety? We we literally pay you to be perfect. We want a refund on some of that money. Like, we pay you to be a Jesus person, and here we come to find out, scandalously, you haven't been a perfect Jesus person? Huh? Some of you have never heard a pastor be honest like that. You've grown up in church for decades, and you just assumed that the person that brought the word on a Sunday morning lived this perfect life, had the perfect prayer life, had the perfect family life, and if that was you, I hope I popped that bubble pretty big today, because the past several months has been tough for me, and I'm not perfect, and I haven't been perfect, and that won't come as a shock for those of you that know me. And it won't come as a shock for those of you who've been in the church for a long time. Here's the truth. There is no perfect Christian. There is no perfect church. Now, some of you are wondering, but you've continued to preach and do your job. Yeah, I've continued to show up at the office and do my job because here's the truth. If I only preached when I felt perfect with the Lord, you'd never see me. If I only wrote sermons when I felt like I was on the mountaintop, you'd get like seven a year be really awkward 43 times a year when you showed up. So all of us continue to go through the motions at times, but we're in these storms of life. If you're newer to Salina First or you've been around, here's what Salina First is. It's a body of believers made up of people who struggle, who proclaim to love God but then struggle to follow God who know in their heart that they love the Lord but still struggle with doubt, who battle addiction, who battle fear, who worry and have this desire to flee from life's responsibilities when it seems like it's all too much. But we don't talk about that much, do we? We don't talk about that much at a church. We don't often share what's on our minds because one of two reasons— we know that we actually have it much better than other people. So that's one of the things that keeps me from being honest at times, is I look around and I see other families struggle, or I see other people struggle, and I think, man, you're going to complain about what you, how you feel? Look at them. Like, they've got it so much worse. So, so you kind of you guilt yourself back into just being quiet, because I could have it worse. I have a roof over my head. I have running water. I have a, a lovely family. Really, you're going to complain? So sometimes we don't share what's going on honestly because of that. Or, it's, if you do share honestly, it's met up with this. Suck it up, buttercup. No one cares. We keep moving. Now, y'all Mercer County people know what I'm talking about. Because when I think of Mercer County, I don't think of a bastion of people sharing their feelings freely about how they feel. 
I think of hard work. I think of get to work no matter how you feel. I think of our, all our backs hurt. Keep moving. I think of all of us have had a bad day. Keep moving. And so some of us didn't grow up with, when we were having a bad day, the freedom to say, I'm having a really bad day. I'm having a bad month. I'm having a bad year. Because it would have been melt with, everyone has a bad day. What are you complaining about? So we don't talk about this too much in the church. We just keep quiet. And here's the problem. That plays into the storm's hand. Because we feel alone. We feel lost. We feel adrift. We feel ashamed. We feel like, where is God in the midst of this? Where's my community in the midst of this? We just kind of keep showing up and keep going through the motions. So I want to share with you this morning a very special scripture to me. It's been a life preserver for me. And again, my visual picture of myself is there's just times where I feel like I'm lost at sea and I'm just kind of floating around and the waves are coming and I'm like, God, this is not going to go well. This is not going well. In Psalm 13, Psalm 13 has been a life preserver for my soul. Because as it turns out, There are people who struggle with doubt, fear, anxiety, worry, depression right here in the Bible. Now, we all think to be a Christian, you can't have any of that in your life, and yet here they are right here in the Scriptures. And their words are for us right here in the Scriptures. So I want to share those words with you because they've ministered so much to my spirit as I've kind of come out of the storm a lot because of Psalm 13. So today I want to spend time with King David, and we'll examine his words in Psalm 13 and show you that there is one perfect person in this book, and his name is Jesus Christ. No one else. And the rest of us can find comfort from these words. This is Psalm 13, a psalm of the King David. How long, Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my soul? How long will my enemies triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice at my fall. But, most important word in this psalm, but, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praises, for he has been good to me. Now this psalm will likely stand out for some of you, probably many of you aren't really familiar with it because it's not Psalm 23, and we don't read this at funerals, and this might stand out to you because you think King David, he, he's the one that I learned about. He slayed Goliath. That's King David writing, where are you, God? Show up or I'm going to die. My enemies are going to try. He's the great king. He's the great king of the Jews. He united all of Israel in the promised land, and yet here he is at a very low spot, clearly, crying out before God. The great king is questioning God's very presence in his life. How could that be? Well, church, the great king and the great wrestler are one and the same. David had all of this going on in his heart and God's anointing on his life. So let's walk through what he's saying in this psalm. There's a very unique structure to it. And he starts in verse 1 by asking three specific questions. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? And how long will you hide your face from me? Three clear questions to God about David and God's relationship. How long will it be like this? How long will you forget about me? Because it's like this, you've clearly forgotten about me. How long will you seemingly hide from me? There is this clear, okay, God, where are you from David? 
You're not coming through in the way I need you to. It's like you've forgotten about me in the midst of this storm of life. It's like I'm all alone. David seems to be writing and crying out. We've all been here, haven't we? We've all felt like this when the storms of life suddenly come in, the diagnosis comes in, the phone call comes where we go, okay, God, what's this about? Where are you in the midst of this? I don't see your hand in the midst of this. I I try and be faithful, but how am I in this situation? Where have you gone? David has this feeling clearly for some time and questions God, where are you? Are you, and how long will it be this way? Then in verse 2, he says, How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my soul? How long will my enemy triumph over me? This turns from a question of God, asking questions to God, to still asking questions but giving a picture of, of David's current state. He's what he's feeling in the midst of God's seeming absence. He says that his thoughts, his head is giving him battle and that feelings of sorrow have captured his soul. The the Hebrew is better. I think soul is better than heart there. And that an enemy is triumphing over him. And I don't think an enemy has to be clearly human here but perhaps an issue or a situation. Certainly it can be that for us rather than a direct human enemy. David has all these worries and doubt and he's wrestling in his head which produces this sadness in his heart. Church, what did I tell you? Here you are on the pages of Scripture. Here I am on the pages of Scripture. All of us have had seasons of doubt, fear, anxiety racing around our heads and we think, I'm a Christian. I believe in God, but man, I don't feel like God is in my life right now. I'm a Christian. I feel these things, and I look around, and I can't figure out why do I feel this sadness in my soul. I'm supposed to be a Christian, and yet it feels like a weighted blanket. It's just carried on me. It's heavy. David continues in verse 3, Look on me and answer Lord, my God. It's a weird thing here that David's doing. He's commanding God to do something. I don't know if you're familiar with this. You don't really get to tell the boss what to do, all right? David is actually making a command to the Lord here. Look on me and answer. And then he steps it back, Lord, my God. <laughs> it's, like, it's like when you finally talk back to your parent, and then you say, ma'am, at the end, right? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. God, look on me. Give, my light, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I've overcome him. My foes will rejoice when I fall. David's attention turns back from how he's feeling to God in the midst of how he's feeling, seemingly crying out or demanding that God give him an answer to look on me, give me light. What he's saying is I'm sick of walking in darkness that surrounds me. It's overwhelming me. Give me light, Lord. Break through this darkness. David is looking down an enemy, and again, I don't think it has to be a human enemy. We're not told. For us, it's likely more our battles with anxiety or addiction or depression. And we worry that if it stays like that much longer, the enemy, whatever it is, is going to win. Can you relate? Can you relate to being in seasons like this where your soul feels sorry, you're doing battle with thoughts in your head, you're looking around and you see God nowhere to be found? Because I know it's not just me, and you're thinking, I'm a Christian, I know, I, I know what I'm supposed to believe, but I don't really believe any of that. I know what I'm supposed to feel, but I don't really feel any of that. And so you feel more guilt and shame because you don't have the right feelings and the right thoughts. So glad David didn't end the psalm there. Because <laughs> that's where most of us end. We just kind of stay in that spot of, ugh. But David says, but. 
The most important word in this psalm is but, because what David is saying is all of this is true, but so is this. David says, but I trust in your unfailing love and my heart, my soul, the same soul that was captured by sorrow, my soul rejoices in your salvation, your saving of me. I will sing the Lord's praises for he has been good to me. All of this is true. My soul is captured by sorrow. My thoughts torment me. My enemies look on me and say, I'm going to have victory over him, but, but in the midst of that, I will sing to the Lord his praises. I will remember his unfailing love. That same soul captured by sorrow will rejoice because God has saved me. And all seemingly at the same time, co-mingling with David, In the midst of this hardship, I will remember God's love. In the midst of this hardship, I will remember God's past grace upon me. Perhaps now you're seeing how these six simple verses can be very powerful. How they can minister to your soul on these dark days. I could have written a lot on this. I kind of narrowed it down to three takeaways I want you to think about today. I had about 20, I got three. And the first point is this. Some of you just need permission, and some of you just need to hear this from a pulpit. Christians, folks that love Jesus, faithful to God, pray, know the gospel, Christians go through very difficult and dark seasons. We must get rid of this idea that if you are a Christian, your soul will never struggle you will never struggle. You will never have anxiety. There's that old saying that's in the church, and I'm not trying to make a judgment or hurt anyone's feelings if you've said this, but you you ask someone, hey, how you doing? And the the response back, Dave Ramsey says it all on a show, better than I deserve, brother. That's Dave Ramsey. That's my Ramsey impression. He's from Tennessee. How you doing? Better than I deserve. And it comes from this Christian theology that we deserve hell. So because I will someday in eternity get heaven, no matter what happens in the meantime, I am doing better than what I deserve. It is factually 100% true. It aligns with the scriptures. But what it also communicates is that I, it doesn't matter if I'm having a bad day or going through a dark season of struggle, because at least I won't go to hell when I die. I'm 34. I hope I have many more years on this earth. So I'm sorry, but when I'm having a bad day, just the fact that I'm saved from hell isn't always enough because it feels like hell right now. It feels like hell what I'm sitting in. But in the church, whenever you ask, how you doing, brother? Better than I deserve. Just clipping along. Other people have it worse than me. Stop complaining. Get to work. And it seems to communicate that Christians don't go through hard seasons, that we can say, I'm not doing good. In fact, I'm doing quite bad. My heart feels sorrow. And so what happens is we all run around and fake it. I'm a Christian. I can't struggle. I can't be wondering where God is or even if he exists. I can't have this much fear and doubt. If I do, can I really believe in God? Can I be a Christian? Well, you answer me, church. How many of you think David still had belief in God in Psalm 13? Raise your hand if you think David still had belief in God in Psalm 13. Okay, I'm on team David still believed in God, right? So that's where I'm firmly planted. And yet he had all of this doubt and worry and anger and frustration in his soul at the same time. Because it seems people who are faithful can still and will still go through very difficult and dark seasons of anxiety and faith, of fear and faith. And you will find them commingling in your soul. You will find them wrestling, is what David says. Wrestling in your soul. Even if you love the Lord dearly, you will go through dark seasons. You will go through hard seasons. You will have doubt, 
fear, anxiety, worry, lack of trust, lack of faith, to name a few. And in the midst of everything, you might look fine on the surface. In the midst of everything, people would look at you and be like, they're good. That's probably what people looked at with David. He's, he's fine. Kingdom's going pretty well. And people will look at you and do the same. You might feel like that today. That's how I felt. Some of you are like, man, I can't believe Craig had that going on. I thought the sermons were all right. I mean, it wasn't his best, but he was fine, right? Give him a D, D plus. That's on a curve. It's nice. I mean, be surprised. Wait, wait, he, he was feeling these seasons? Yeah. And this sermon isn't about me, but I want to stand up here and be vulnerable and honest because I know that by me sharing this, it will crack the door open for you to be vulnerable and honest in your life. If it takes me getting up here and admitting that I've gone through really hard and dark seasons and not just because my dad died or not just because something bad happened. My dad hasn't died. Dad, I'm sorry. I didn't just mean to kill you in the sermon. He watches online. I'll get a text message like, what are you doing, man? Like, I didn't go through any tragedy, and yet I was feeling this. And not five years ago, five weeks ago. And if I can stand up here and be honest, and it just helps some of you feel like I'm not alone, then it's worth it. Because Christians go through very difficult seasons of doubt and struggle that is hard, and it is dark. So let's not be the kind of church that just pretends Let's not be the kind of church that just pretends to have it all together. We all have perfect marriages. We all have perfect kids. We all have perfect faith. We all have perfect bank accounts. We all have perfect social media manicured lives. I would rather be the kind of church that looks like King David, honest and vulnerable and seeking God in the midst of it. Because it's not just about being vulnerable. It's not just about saying, oh, I'm really struggling today, just so that people go, oh, man, I'm, I'm really sorry. It's about being honest, but David wasn't just honest for honest sake. He was honest in the middle of his seeking. He didn't just sit down and wallow in it. He sought God out in it, which is our second point today. When you're in the storm, cry and seek God. I see people fall into two different ditches, typically, we fall into the one ditch that we've talked about a little bit where the storm is raging, but we just pretend everything is all right. (laughs) You know, like life is falling apart and you're just like whistling. We've all seen that picture. I don't know if you've seen it of the guy mowing his lawn and there's a tornado in the background. (laughs) And it's like, nope, just doing my thing. Just keeping my eyes, just making straight lines. And it's like, oh, there's a tornado. You should probably. (laughs) So some of us do that when the storms of life come up, and that's a ditch we fall into. We just pretend everything's fine, I'm blessed, too, uh, you know, better than I deserve, and we just kind of keep moving. Or there's another ditch we fall into, with it, which is a mixture of self-pity and walking away from the faith. And I don't mean self-pity fully in a negative way. These people have things to feel sorry about. There are real issues in their life that they're facing. If you get laid off and suddenly your life's upended or you get the cancer diagnosis, you're going to have some self-pity, and that's okay. But it can lead to this place of falling in this ditch and kind of feeling like they're called to walk away or they don't know what they believe. And it's in these moments that their enemy, whatever that enemy is, tries to claim victory over them. I've seen some friends fall into this ditch where they just kind of walk away from the faith that they once held so dear and clung to because they can't seem to square up how could a Christian find themselves in such a difficult and dark season and have God still love them? How could God, if he loves me, allow something like this to come into my life? The question that's been asked since the beginning of faith, why do good things happen to, bad things happen to good people? And so they fall into this ditch and they sit there and they just kind of wander away from the faith because they can't square up. If God really loved me, he wouldn't let me be here. David shows us another path. Not one of pretending everything's okay, not one of saying I'm done with any of this. David shows us one of crying out and seeking God in the midst of it. He's asking God, where are you? 
When will you come through? When are you going to light up the darkness? He says five clear questions, crying out to God and pleading and asking, how long will this storm last? How long will this darkness last? And some of you need to hear permission this morning that it is okay to ask God really, really hard questions. The reason we fall into ditches or walk away or pretend everything is okay is precisely because the church hasn't done a good enough job being vulnerable and honest and showing you people throughout the scriptures who cry out to God and seek God in the midst of their vulnerability and honesty, seeking God's face in the storm. Here's the funny thing I always kind of find myself laughing about is God already knows my heart. So I get really angry, and I pout, and I give God the silent treatment, and then I think, well, that's, that's not going to work with him. <laughs> he, he, he knows what I'm feeling. He, he, he knows what I'm thinking, so I've just gotten in the habit of just letting him have it, letting him know where I stand. Maybe you don't think it'll help, or maybe you've just never had those really authentic times of prayer before, and if you grew up and prayer was a really formulaic thing and like you prayed before dinner and, and that was it and you knew the prayer you were supposed to say, going to God in prayer and be like, what are you doing? Where are you at? I don't see you in my life. It feels almost unholy. But you're already thinking it. And if we actually believe the gospel and God actually knows every hair on our head and every thought in our mind, then he already knows what you're thinking. So communicating it to him is not something more. And it's the only true way to seek his face in the midst of difficulty. The honest prayer of God, what are you doing and why are you allowing this to happen, church? That prayer will keep you in relationship with God in the midst of the storm. Crying out won't always be pretty. It won't always be polite Christian prayers that we say before Thanksgiving. They will be raw, they will be honest, they will ask questions, they will be full of all sorts of things. There are times I've prayed and I've had to reflect and I know that my own prayers were covered in pride and arrogance and ego and making demands of God. And I've had to go back and kind of unravel some of those things, but I would rather pray in that way than not pray at all. I'd rather wrestle through my sin in the muck and cry out in the middle of the storm And hand it all over to God because I actually believe he's big enough to handle it. And in that act of prayer, at least I'm seeking his face. At least in that act of prayer, I'm begging for him to come through in the midst of the storm. I'm begging for his light to shine. When you're in the storm, you don't have to pretend, church, that it's sunny in 75. And I beg you not to walk away from the faith. Instead, walk the path David is showing us and cry out and seek God's face of his hand of mercy. So some of you might be wondering, well, Craig, when did it break for you? Like, what what did that look like? Some of you, when you have a really bad week with God and your faith and you you struggle, some of you skip church. I know you do because you're like, I don't want to go anywhere near church, right? You know what I have to do when I have a really bad week? I have to write a sermon. So I want you to imagine you're depressed, you're anxious, you're worried, you don't feel like God is real, you at least don't feel him in your life. Now I want you to write a sermon for 250 people proclaiming Jesus is good! Because if I just get up here and I'm like, "Mm, is he? Some of you are going to have a problem with that. So for, this is probably six weeks ago, I was just feeling weighted. It literally felt like I had a weighted blanket on my soul. And I'm praying and I'm crying out and specifically going, if you want me to write a sermon, this is my prayer in my office, if you want me to write a sermon, you have to do something. I can't write a sermon feeling like this. And I'd say that and then I would try and write a few paragraphs and they were garbage. And I'd be like, I can't do this, God. (laughs) And I have a very public deadline. (laughs) You have to come through. You have to break through. And I'm just sitting at my desk feeling like, what am I doing How is this what Christianity is? How is this what pastoring is? God, you are not coming through, and I don't understand. If you can make the heavens and the earth, surely you can part these clouds in my soul. And these were my prayers. This isn't me reenacting. This is literally what I'm sitting at my desk praying. And probably an hour later, my phone rings, 
and it's Pastor Randy Christian. And some of you know Randy, some of you don't. I'm like, I have no idea why Randy's calling me. I pick up. I'm like, hey, brother. Hey, Randy, how are you? Like, I'm not screaming at my desk. And, uh, and Randy says this. I felt, I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit that I needed to call and pray for you right now and pray over you. And I just was like, okay. And I start just crying. Because God heard my prayer in the midst of the storm. And Randy just prayed over me, and his words were like grace. I don't even know what he said. But it just felt like, that can't be a coincidence. Randy doesn't call me just to pray over me. I think he's done that twice in six years. That I, but on that day, in that moment, in that time of crying out, Randy calls me and just says, hey, I just felt led by the Holy Spirit to call and pray for you, and I'm telling you, it broke the storm. The prayers of another brother, and I needed it to come from another human at that point. I really think back now. I needed to see God answer me in a supernatural way to remind me, like, okay, that's weird, that, that's God. That's moving in my life. And, and he prayed, and we hung up, and it was probably a two-minute phone call, if that. And I didn't tell him what was going on in my life. I just said, hey, thanks. And, and, and this is what I, I was like, all right. And I just wrote the sermon. And the words were there. Because God was there. He was there before. I just couldn't see him. It was dark. And a brother in God and I just cried out, and I felt angry, and I felt upset, and I was just crying out in the midst of that. And that prayer brought me back to my foundation. And that's our final point for us today. Do not forget your foundation. Love, salvation, and past blessings. That prayer brought me back. It centered me in it. It gave me enough light through the storm that I could kind of see and I could feel God's presence in my life and the, the Spirit was moving in other people's hearts on my behalf and who am I and God loves me that much and it brought me back and that is what David says here. It's why he ends in this place. He's not just spitballing. He's saying something actually quite profound. This psalm would be completely different if it was just four verses. But this final verse shows us a path in the midst of the storm where David settles his soul and comebacks and camps on in the middle of the storm. He shows us his foundation. The unfailing love of God, his salvation, and the times God has been good to him. Three things David chooses with great care. Why love? Why does he start there? Because remembering God's unfailing love will keep us in relationship in the midst of the storm. It's no different than marriage when you're fighting. Love is what brings you back together. Love is what keeps you in relationship in the midst of the storm. And there will be times that you will begin to wonder if God ever loved you at all. Because if he did love you, how could he allow this hard thing to happen to you? Or has God left you? But when you remember God's unfailing love, it will remind you that God's love is unfailing, even in the midst of the storm, that he can be with you in these things. And it's why David says, I will trust, I trust in your unfailing love. That's really important, church, because David is choosing to trust in God's love above his circumstance. If God says his love never fails, David is choosing to trust in it. And trust means you're willing to put your weight on something. I trust a bridge so I'll walk across it, even though there's currents underneath. I trust in God's love, not the circumstances in my life. I trust in God's love, not the lies that roam around your heart and in your head. I trust in God's love so that I stay in relationship with him. Next, David says, I remember my heart rejoices, my soul, the same one that's captured by sorrow, it rejoices in your salvation. That fact that God has saved us as a Christian salvation, God does rescue us from hell and promises us heaven beyond this life, and that gives us hope in the midst of the storm. Because the truth is, we will all have one final storm in this life, and it will be the last one. 
So when in the midst of that, that salvation and that promise, when this life comes to an end, heaven's going to feel really great. Knowing and trusting in that salvation, and David reminds himself of that because even when things get so bad and you think my time might be coming here to an end, you remind yourself that your time is only temporary here, but eternal in heaven. Amen? Salvation can give us hope because we know what waits for all those who call upon the name of Jesus Christ. And David says he will remember how God has been good to him, and it gives him perspective in the storms. It is so easy in the midst of hurt and pain to forget how God has come through in your life, how he has provided in your life, how he's answered prayers in your life. Many in this room, if you've been following Jesus for any time at all, have dozens and dozens and dozens of ways that God has blessed you richly, And yet, in the midst of the storm, you can seem to forget those things, can't you? So David says, I will remember, remind myself of, the times God has been good to me. That God has never left me, or forsaken me. That life is in all darkness, That he's led me out of hard seasons before and that he's been good to me before. There have been great days before and Lord willing, there will be again. Church, when it gets hard, do not forget your foundation. Love, salvation, and God's hand in your life, past blessing, because God's love will keep you in relationship. Remembering your salvation will remind you that there is hope beyond this hard, hard place no matter what comes your way. And remembering past blessings will give you much-needed perspective. You'll see the forest and not just the trees. My hope for you today is that you see people in the Bible who have struggled and wrestled and doubted and feared in the face of knowing God is good. And my hope for you today is to see that those will in, at times co-mingle in your soul. And I hope that you hear this today and be like, wow, I guess I just don't struggle with that. Praise God if that's your story. For the rest of us, here we are. For the faith-filled doubters, here we are. For the anxious praisers, here we are. For those of you who wonder and worry and, and have these seasons of depression, here we are. We're standing next to King David. I feel like that's pretty decent company to keep. Here we are walking towards Jesus together, and my prayer is that you would learn to cry out to God in the midst of the darkness and seek his face in the midst of the darkness, that you wouldn't pretend everything's okay, but that you wouldn't fall away from your faith either, that you'd keep on walking. And church, if you do, I just think you're going to see God break through, because he always does, because he is bigger than the storm. I could write for a long time on Psalm 13. I think that might be a book someday, Lord willing, that that, that might be there. This text has been a life preserver to me. And some of you are in the storm now, and I hope you just feel like God fell through you a life preserver in the midst of it. Let's pray as the worship team comes forward. God, I thank you for Psalm 13 and King David and the vulnerability he showed I thank you for Pastor Randy Christian and his ministry and all he's meant to me. And I thank you, God, that even in the midst of the storms, you love us, you saved us, and you have been so very good to us, and you set us free. God, I pray for my friends that are in the midst of it right now. They're they're doubting, they're hurting, they're struggling. Man, I pray that they would remember how good you've been to them and how much you love them. That they would actually feel that, that 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 ray of sunshine would break through the darkness. God, help us to worship you in song one final time today. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.